This is Hear Me Out. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. July is the month where the most children per day are accidentally injured or killed by firearms in this country. But there's not really a month where these tragedies don't happen. It is all too common that children from toddlers to adolescents happen upon a gun in their homes and don't fully understand what they're looking at. Just under half of Americans live in a home with a gun, so put aside your feelings about gun control for just a moment, and let's consider if guns are an inevitability in our society, how can we keep kids safer in their own homes? Don't you want your child to know what to do if they find a firearm somewhere it's not supposed to be? That's not political. That has nothing to do with politics. Writer and gun rights activist Yehuda Reamer joins us on Hear Me Out in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Last month, 31-year-old Laura Ilg was shot and killed in her Ohio home. She was eight months pregnant, and the best efforts of doctors could not save her or her unborn child. The shooter who ended those two lives was Laura's two-year-old son. He probably did not understand that the thing he was playing with was dangerous. One can hope that for a few more years, at least, he won't fully understand what happened as a result. Firearms are the leading cause of death for American children now, by far. And last year, there were at least 355 unintentional shootings in which a kid pulled trigger without meaning to. According to data from the nonprofit Every Town for Gun Safety, the month of July has the highest number of unintentional shootings of or by children per day. Many people think very young kids are not strong enough to pull a trigger, but kids have shot themselves and others. The best-selling firearms in the U.S. are handguns like Glocks and Sig Sauer's, and more than 60% of handguns require a trigger pull strength of less than five pounds. Now, this is not going to be a conversation about the merits of owning a gun, so hold your thoughts about that. 44% of Americans live in a home with a gun, even if they personally are not a gun owner. The question is, what can we do to prevent these kinds of tragedies that are called unintentional shootings? Our guest today says the problem is our attitude, in a way. Trying to keep guns away from kids might be putting them in more danger because knowledge, in this instance, might just be safety. Our guest is Yehuda Reamer, a writer and gun rights activist. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So maybe first, for those who don't know you, tell us uh, what you do. So I write children's books on firearm safety, firearms education, history of the Second Amendment for children, and other fun stuff, uh, some satirical stuff, all related to firearms. I have a whole brand called the Pew Pew Jew, which educates Jews on their Second Amendment rights. And I'm just out in the field advocating for the Second Amendment. So it sounds from what I've read about your um, upbringing, it sounds like you and I had kind of opposite experiences. Because I grew up in an environment where my grandparents on my dad's side were avid hunters and had a large gun collection, members of the NRA, and took us to the firing range and taught us how to use guns from a very young age. It sounds like you had the opposite experience. Yeah, I grew up in a home where politics was never discussed. Firearms were not even a a question about owning them. So I wasn't allowed, you know, I didn't know about the Second Amendment. I didn't know about gun ownership. Heck, I always thought that the only people that owned guns were military, law enforcement, and bad guys. Uh, I didn't even, I didn't understand that a civilian was allowed to own a firearm. And that's just the way I grew up. So when did you first uh, put your hands on a gun? So I had gone shooting a few times when I was in my teens. Uh, In Israel, I visited my buddies and I went shooting. But I didn't buy my first gun until I was married with two kids. Uh, I must have been about 26 at the time, give or take. Okay. So let's go to what you're here for, which is to tell us about your opinion, which is that Correct me if I'm wrong, it kind of sounds like the same approach um, that many Europeans have to alcohol, which is that by keeping alcohol away from kids, you make it more mysterious and attractive. Is that sort of what you see about guns? Yeah, pretty much. Um, You know, I believe, as well as many other firearms owners out there, responsible firearms owners especially, 
that educating your children from a very young age on firearms is a very important thing. And what I mean by, you know, uh, educating them, I'm like, I'm not letting a two year old run around with a loaded gun. I'm not letting them even touch a gun. But what I believe is that if you educate them from a young age and, and, and let me let me say this, that it doesn't make a difference if you're conservative, liberal, right side, left side, libertarian, take politics completely out of this. Firearms education is elemental to safety because if you are, let's say, at a park with your child or your nieces or nephews or something like that, it's a possibility. And it's been found in the news that kids will find firearms. Let's say someone was trying to run away from the police or whatever it was the night before. People have found firearms in shrubbery or something like that. So, again, taking politics out of it, don't you want your child to know what to do? If they find a firearm somewhere it's not supposed to be, again, that's not political. That has nothing to do with politics. Just from an educational standpoint, you do not want your child picking up that gun and saying, oh, wow, look at this and showing all of his friends and pointing a possibly loaded gun at all his friends. You just don't want that. So by educating them from a young age about the the effects guns have, what guns can do and how to properly handle them and what to do in a situation, I think is incredibly important. So how is that different from the many propositions out there to require things like gun safes um, to make sure that gun owners have to um, have guns stowed in um, safe places, that they have them stowed unloaded, for example, that they have trigger locks? How is that different from the many propositions and proposals out there to to make gun ownership more regulated and to make guns themselves safer? Well, I don't believe that we should be regulating people on how to live their lives. What I will tell you is this. Owning a gun is your right. Practicing gun safety is your responsibility. And what I mean by that is nearly every gun owner I know and I know a lot, have gun safes, and they have their guns locked up, and they are not accessible to children. Now, if someone decides to leave a loaded firearm around their home with kids present, and God forbid something happens where a child will pick up that gun and and shoot someone, that parent should 100% be liable and get in serious trouble. But for me, for, for anyone to tell me how to live my life, that's I, I think that's a, a horrible stance to take. And I don't think we should be forcing anything upon anyone in terms of uh, firearm safety. Again, I think it's incredibly important. And I think parents need to take proper safety precautions from a young age to educate your children so that kids do understand the power of a firearm. But to say that you have to keep a gun unloaded in a safe, I think is absurd. And the reason is because if I need to grab a firearm in the middle of the night because someone breaks into my home, I want every every second counts. I want access to my loaded firearm to defend my family. Uh, You know, to mandate a safe, I think is wrong. Although I tell every single person that I instruct and that I train, you need a safe. Uh, that it is the way to go. But I I don't think that we should be forcing things upon people that they don't want to do. But again, you've said to take politics out of it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to look at the evidence here, which is um, you said you don't you you think people who the people you know who are gun owners put their most of them own own a gun safe. That may be true, but they're not putting their guns in the gun safe and they're not keeping them away from kids. Oh, I didn't say Um, that. The evidence the evidence shows that parents, especially of adolescents, and that's teenagers, and that's the most at-risk group when it comes to unintentional deaths of guns, they are the most, those parents are the most likely to keep um, their guns stored in the home unsafely. That means unlocked and loaded, or uh, both, (laughs) which means that people who own guns often have more than one gun and they are not storing them safely. And many of these are parents of kids who are highly at risk for shooting these guns, either in an intentional act of harming themselves. And again, that uh, demographic is teenagers and um, especially males in their 
20s, or unintentionally, which again is adolescence. So why not simply, as we do with seatbelts, as we do with putting up guardrails on a highway, why not simply create safety regulations to save the lives of children? Because every gun owner knows the safety regulations already. Now, whether they're practicing it or not, that's a, that's up to them. Now, I, hi- I hope that they practice proper gun safety. All, all my firearms are locked up. My kids don't have access to them. They know where they are, but they don't have access to my safe combination. Every person who owns a firearm knows about gun safety, knows about keeping your kids away from any firearm without parental supervision. They know that. Now, if a teenager is able to find, if a teenager knows the combination to a safe, 99% of the time it's because the parents told them that. And if a parent is that negligent, then that parent, like I said earlier, should be held accountable if that child does anything wrong or harms anyone with a firearm. But if you have a toy that you buy for your kid and they discover that there's a part that falls off of it and and children are dying because they choke on it, the federal government steps in and they pull the toy off the market. Let's say that I were to say, look, (laughs) we're going to put a label on this and you know that if you buy this toy, your kid might choke on it and die. The government isn't going to let them sell that toy. It's going to it might kill kids. I I mean, it just seems to me like if you know that here's this thing that is still killing kids and, and 2022 had the record number of unintentional shootings, including both injuries and deaths of children in the United States. Uh, I mean, we we know ways. We have the evidence. We know how to make it safer. Why not just save children's lives by, A, making the guns themselves safer, and B, putting regulations on it so that all these parents who do know what the gun safety rules are know better to follow them and know that if they don't follow them, there are going to be some consequences. But we already have that in place. Understand, right? Adding more regulations. If a parent is that negligent already by leaving a loaded firearm around the home or giving access to their safe to children, having the government say, oh, if you do that, you're going to get in trouble or we no, you're not allowed to do that. That's against the law. They're already doing it anyways. And they it, they know it's a stupid thing to do, but they are being negligent and they are being lazy. So adding more laws about telling gun owners how to keep their guns stored isn't going to change anything. Again, if parents are already doing it by being negligent, nothing's going to change. They're, 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 they're be like, we're in our own home. Now, keep in mind, I, I want you to understand that as a gun activist, I hate that practice. I, I, I want you to. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that's of course. Of right. Course. Right. Like, yeah, I, I want course. you to understand that I am vehemently against parents giving access to firearms to children or giving codes to safes for children unless that child is thoroughly educated on firearms practices. But I'm highly against parents being negligent with firearms. Like I said, owning a gun is a right. Practicing gun safety is a responsibility. That's what it comes down to. And if you choose to negate that responsibility and and you know, shrug it off and say, oh, you know, my home, my rules, I can do whatever I want. Well, again, whether there's laws in place or not, there are already laws in place for something like that. And yes, there are consequences that will happen. If a, if a child shoots another child, brings a gun to school and kills someone and they're underage, then yes, absolutely. Oh, Yehuda, I feel like the consequences... <laughs> feel like they need to be less than death. I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that, but we're going to talk about your vision of, of training kids to, to handle guns safely, because that's what, what you're really here to talk about. But first, we have to take a break. This is Slate's podcast, Hear Me Out, and that's what we're doing. And we will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Want to feel better, get more exercise, or quit tobacco? Prescription for Wellness can improve your health with personalized sessions based on your schedule. Our expert health coaches and care managers use proven techniques. It's free for UPMC Health Plan members and could lead to the results you want. For more information, visit upmchp.us pfwellness. That's upmchp.us slash pfwellness. 
Hey listeners, this is Joel Anderson, host of Slate's Slow Burn, Becoming Justice Thomas. I want to tell you about a live event we're doing on July 25th at 7.30 p.m. at the Hamilton in Washington, D.C. Join me and a few very special guests for a night of conversation, a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the show, and even a few surprises. I'll be interviewing Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of the Judiciary Committee, NYU law professor and MSNBC commentator Melissa Murray, Georgetown law professor Michelle Goodwin, and Thomas's old college friend Eddie Jenkins, a former NFL player and attorney. We'll talk all about the life and career of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, including his decades-long battle with affirmative action. And I'll perform an extended story from the season that may surprise, but will definitely delight you. For a limited number of fans, we will also host a pre-show cocktail hour with the Slow Burn team. And those who purchase that VIP package will get complimentary drinks and time with your favorite Slatesters. And if you're a Slate Plus member, you will receive a discount off your purchase. Go to slate.com slash slow burn live for more information and to purchase tickets. That's slate.com slash slow burn live. Hope to see you there. And we're back. Yehuda Reamer is talking about removing the mystery and I guess attraction to guns among kids by training them to handle them safely. This podcast is called Hear Me Out and that is exactly what we're doing. We are hearing out this opinion that many people may not agree with, including myself. But I I find it interesting, um, especially coming from somebody who did not yourself handle guns as a kid. So tell me about your approach to making guns safer for kids um, by letting them handle guns at a young age. Like if how young should they be? Okay, so that's a great question. I'm asked that frequently. So I wrote a book called Safety On, an introduction to the world of firearms for children. And my book touches touches on every aspect of firearm safety, uh, from range rules to what to do if you find a gun somewhere it's not not supposed to be, to just having a healthy respect as a a tool, keeping them clean um, and understanding the power behind them. Now, how early can you start teaching kids about guns? I mean, you can start teaching them whatever age you want, but at what point are they actually paying attention? I wrote my first book. I started reading it to him at four years old. Now, even though I was reading him a book, he didn't touch a gun or shoot a gun until he was eight. In those four years, we went over every aspect of the gun, how to, how to put it together, the different parts of a gun, he knew the ins and outs of my handgun. The reason is it's important to know what you're dealing with. But as I was, if I went shooting and I brought my guns home and I wanted to clean them, he would sit there with me. And I do this with my other kids as well. I will take the gun, take a magazine out, make sure there's no rounds in the chamber. And I will show my kids do you see any rounds in the chamber? And I will open it for them. I will show them how to do that. I will show them how to check it to make sure it's not loaded. And then I will strip the gun down and I will clean the gun in front of them. And a lot of times my kids find it fun and I make it interactive. So if I need to clean the barrel, I'll do the cleaning and then I let them, it's called running a snake through the barrel. I, you know, let them clean the guns with me. I make it interactive. I take away the the cool factor, if you will, that mystique around firearms so that my two older ones right now, they go shooting with me. I have a, a just about 14-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter, and they both love shooting, and they, they have fun. And when we're at the range, they practice gun safety better than most people at the range. They know exactly where to point the gun at all times. They know to keep their finger off the trigger until they are ready to shoot. They know their target and what's beyond the target to make sure that there's no collateral damage. And they all, and this is all possible because from a young age, I was educating them on the importance of guns and the power that a gun has. And it's very similar to countless households across the country who have cooking knives on the counter, right? A lot of people keep these fancy instead of, you know, knives to help cook. But you don't let children at two years old play with knives or you forget, play, use a knife to cut their food. 
you'll always go cut them in little bites for them. And then maybe once they're five years old, you might give them a butter knife, right? Just to, uh, you're a big boy, you're a big girl, here's a butter knife. And as they get older and you're educating and training them, they actually understand what a knife is and what it can do. And it's the same thing as a firearm. I mean, this part, I feel like you and I agree. You know, I mean, like I said, my grandfather, my grandpa um, taught us how to handle a gun. He taught us how to check if a safety taught us how to check if it was loaded. And that was for safety purposes. He was a member of the NRA when the NRA was really a safety organization. (laughs) Yes, I agree. Um, And he, and he would complain about hunters going out there and drinking because he felt like alcohol and guns do not ever, ever, ever mix. A hundred percent. And so I feel as though we're, we're in agreement here that you never, a child never knows when they go into a friend's house or any house, whether there's a gun in the house And it's probably safer to know whether a gun is loaded, whether a gun has a safety on, and to know that a gun is not the way you see it on a movie. A hundred percent. And and again, we can agree on this. That's why I said earlier, right? Take politics out of it. Take about, you know, shall not be infringed or, uh, you know, don't tread on me or take all of that liberalism and conservatism and take all the politics out of it. Let's concentrate on how to make sure accidental shootings do not happen. And I believe that the best way for that to happen is to educate children at a young age. Right. Although there does run the risk of kids, once they get comfortable with a firearm, wanting to show their friends. Right? Yeah, but that's all part of the education. Meaning... Everyone in my community where I live knows what I do for a living. They know I'm in the gun industry and they know I write books and they know exactly what I do day to day with firearms. Yet they still have their kids come to my house and play with, you know, my kids. Now, there are many times where one of the kids will turn to my son, my oldest, for example, and say, can we see your dad's guns or can you ask him? I will call the parents. They say, hey. Your son is interested or or your daughter is interested in firearms and I'm being respectful. Will you let me show your kids some of the firearms and educate them a little? 99% of the time, the people are like, yeah, absolutely have fun because they understand what I do. So my kids, even, even my seven year old who I love to pieces and he's a wild child and I, you know, he even says like, Hey daddy, can I see one of your guns? Can I see your big gun? Can I see your small gun? And I see this, you know, I will never say no unless obviously like I'm running out of the house or something like that. But if my kids want to see the guns, it's a perfect training opportunity and educational opportunity to say, hey, look, this is daddy's handgun. Let's make sure it's unloaded. And I show them how to unload it and I show them how to make sure that there's no round in the chamber. And it's the same thing. My kids know. So if a, if a friend comes over, my kids don't care about showing a gun to their friends because guns are not cool to my kids. It's not like, oh, my daddy has a gun. They don't care about the firearms anymore. It's not anything to them. The the mystique is gone. They understand that a firearm is nothing more than a tool and they treat it as such. So if someone comes over and says, hey, can we see your dad's guns? My kids aren't going to go to my, like I said, my kids don't have at They know where the safe is, but they don't have access. My kids aren't going to go and try to open the safe. If someone wants to, if my kid, if my kids know, if they want to see one of daddy's firearms, all they have to do is ask me. And if I have the time at the moment, I will gladly take it out, show it to them, show them that it's unloaded and let them handle the firearm and teach them, hey, keep your, uh, you know, keep your finger off the trigger. Don't point the gun at anyone you, you know, anything you don't want to destroy. Meaning you got to take every opportunity to educate. So I'm I think a lot of gun owners are like that. And again, like we said earlier, there are some that are not like that, that do not take gun safety responsibly. And unfortunately, you have dire consequences. We have to take another break. Um, We're we're, we're talking about educating kids on how to use a gun in order to keep them safe from gun violence. Definitely a, a strong opinion that I know many people may not agree with, which 
I I think I'm one of them. Yehuda Reamer is a writer and a gun rights activist. Um, We're on a podcast called Hear Me Out, and that's what we're doing. I'm Celeste Headley. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. We're talking to Yehuda Reamer, and we're talking about training kids to be safe around guns by teaching them from a very young age to handle guns safely, um, to understand when a gun is loaded, when the safety is off, how to clean a gun, how to, to remove the mystery around guns. And our guest is a, an, uh, somebody who writes about this, writes children books about this, is, is an activist about gun ownership and gun safety, Yehuda Reamer. Um, so one of the things that I, I have to come back to is the idea of, of brain development in children, um, because there's really good evidence that even if a child knows a lot about gun safety, um, if a child is going through a mental health emergency, simply having ready availability to a firearm puts them at double digit higher risk of taking their own life. Whereas if that is that firearm is not readily available to them in the home, they actually might survive that mental health crisis if there is not a firearm there. Whereas if there is one there, they may not survive. Um, what do you make of that? Because, you know, many of our health, mental health professionals say, look, the only way to completely keep, a, especially an adolescent safe um, or somebody who has issues with mental health is to either remove the gun from the home or just keep it in a safe. Yeah, 100 percent. I know I've said that the whole time. Keep the guns in the safe. Do not give access to the safe to any kid. So what, whether they have mental issues or not, kids should not have access to your gun safe. Uh, I, I don't see. I this don't is what I that. keep coming back to, Yehuda, is that I mean, you and I are in agreement on that, and that is ideally the way that everyone would behave. But that's not the way people behave. A, majority, a, have, a majority, a majority do though. You we can't, don't. We would not have these problems with children dying of accidental deaths. We wouldn't have kids, and the the, the death the deaths are just the worst part. We're not even talking about the injuries where they shoot other children themselves or uh, other adults, and then we're not even talking about the accidental deaths and injuries of adults who, especially fueled by alcohol, um, accidentally fire off. A firearm because the the firearm is lying around and they accidentally fire it. There's even been school safety officers and and law enforcement officers who accidentally fire a, a gun that was lying around and they were moving it from the the a table to a, a counter or something. I mean, the ideal is rarely what happens. Right. But, but you have to keep in mind that the stats you're you're getting from, especially from an organization. And I, I don't this is a whole other podcast and topic. Uh, a lot of places like every town for gun safety, they definitely and it's, it, it has come out that they skew their information. Um, again, we can get into that another time. I, I, you know, we have a few minutes left, but I'm not I don't want to get into that. But, yes, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Right. It, we, we've heard that phrase before. Now, if someone's drunk and picks up a firearm and shoots themselves kind of had it coming uh you know if they shoot yourself in the foot trying to holster it you kind of had it coming uh not to sound like a jerk but again owning a gun and i said this so many times already owning a gun is a right practicing gun safety is a responsibility i go many places i mean i carry a firearm everywhere i go there are so many times where um, I was at I was at a, a friend's house recently. There was a barbecue and there was tons of beer and whiskey. I didn't take a sip. I had water the whole time, even though I I I love myself a good whiskey. I, I live in Texas, right? I love myself a good whiskey, but I didn't touch alcohol. Why? Because I'm a responsible gun owner. So majority of people, what you have to understand is the majority of people do practice proper gun safety and responsibility. There are hundreds of millions of gun owners, and often as you hear accidental shootings, with the amount of gun owners there are, if majority of them were not practicing responsibility, you would hear it a thousand times more. So my point is that, yes, I agree with you that people who drink should not be handling guns. Yeah, I can agree on that. I've actually had a friend of mine 
at my synagogue uh, after services on Saturday. Uh, a lot of, you know, there's a, a little uh, like snacks and stuff for people to mingle and, and hang out. And I had a good buddy of mine. Someone brought in like a $800 bottle of scotch. And my buddy's like, I really want to taste this really badly. I'm like, give it over. And literally, he gave me his handgun and he drank. And I wouldn't give it back to him until after my Sabbath was over. And he was okay with that. He practiced proper gun safety and proper responsibility. I mean, it, it's just, this is tough for me because I, there's so many ways in which you and I have common ground here. A, I, I am also Jewish, uh, although we were, all right, my family was reform. Um, but uh, I also, I grew up, as I said, absolutely believing in gun safety, being trained in how to handle a gun. I also believe that children, I totally believe children should be trained in how to handle a gun, but I cannot get away from the fact that the risk of, of homicide is three times higher if there is a gun in a house. I mean, that's just the facts. And that doesn't even come from every town or any of the ones that you feel skew it. That comes from FBI statistics. Um, the, the risk of suicide coming from the statistics from the CDC goes up like I think it's over 40 percent if there's a gun in the home for for adolescents. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics says the safest home for a child is one that where there is not a gun present. Like it's really difficult. And I that doesn't mean I think your home is not safe with no, guns I, and I, children. I, I, you I you it. are clearly, yeah. But but we also in the United States, you know, when you were talking about um visiting Israel, Israel has very strict laws out on gun ownership. <laughs> very strict. So the United States does not. You can buy a gun here and not have to know gun safety. You don't have to pass. Uh, you don't have to take a gun safety quiz even to know how to 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 store your gun safely. You don't have to watch a video on gun safety in order to become a gun owner here. Right. But there's a, there's a very big difference. The difference is... Israel, and don't get me wrong, as an Orthodox Jew, I love Israel. I don't think I'd ever be able to move there, but I love Israel. The big difference that sets America apart, not just from Israel, but from every other country in the world, is we have the ability, we have the Second Amendment, which gives us the right to self-defense against a tyrannical government, as well as someone breaking into my home, right? We have that God-given right. Whereas all the other states, all the other countries, uh, sorry, not states, countries, do not have that built into the fabric of their nation. So to appease a few, to take away my rights on how I want to defend myself and how I want to defend my family is one of the most dangerous things you can possibly do in any country. Look, if, if you're, 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 you keep throwing out all these statistics and facts and stuff like that, you want to talk about facts. Let's look at all the all the murderous regimes in history. The first thing they always did was confiscate guns, right? Let's talk about the right. But I I I know, but I, I feel like we're getting off of the topic of keeping kids safe, which is where I want to keep it here. The reason I bring up gun laws is because one of the reasons you have laws and regulations on a dangerous firearm is to keep people safe. The one of the reasons you have airbags in a car is to save lives. One of the reasons you have it's it's required by law to have a, a a car seat for a child is because we found out that when you don't have a car seat, um kids die. And to me, you know, again, it's hard, much harder to get a driver's license than it is to get a gun in the United States, which means there's a lot of gun owners out there who don't know the basics of gun ownership, which means there's a lot of kids living in homes with people who don't know how to handle that gun or store it safely. That's 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 my issue here. And there's kids getting injured and killed. And I understand that. But what are we supposed to do? There are 20,000 gun laws on the books across the country. Do you think adding more is going to make a difference? Uh, a, that's a little bit. Uh, disingenuous because a so many of those twenty thousand laws are replicative. Um, they're different, varying according to state. They're, yeah, they're no, no, not no, 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 enforced. I'm not, I'm not talking, I mean, that's I'm not talking about federal. Law. We're not I'm talking about, about federal laws. Yeah, they're those are really, really different. No, yeah. no, no. All right, you're one hundred percent. Okay, let me let me rephrase. 
there are 20,000 laws across the country that are not necessarily federal, right? Yeah. How many more laws do we have to add? How many more restrictions do we put on gun owners that truly will infringe on their rights? You say you want to protect kids. Me personally, I think the best way to protect kids is having people, someone, people like me and all the people I know carry firearms and train their kids with firearms. That's the best way I know to protect kids. I, I'll tell you what, I, I would be glad if in order for someone to, to purchase a gun, they had to go through your training course. What if we did that? What if we we required that they had to go through a gun safety course and pass it before they were able to get a gun license? Um, again, owning a gun is a right. Practicing safety is a responsibility, right? You cannot man. You can't. You can't mandate someone to do something that they don't want to do necessarily. We when totally it comes, can. When we it, do it all wait, the time. Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> when it comes to a God-given right, that's not a God-given right. That's in the the Constitution. Aren't God-given rights? That's not God-given. You're right. The Second Amendment isn't necessarily a God-given right. It's the Second Amendment. However, the right to self-defense is a God-given right. And how I practice. The way I defend myself, my family, my friends, my community, that's that's God given. No one should be telling me what I can and cannot do or how I can and cannot do it. I mean, we're going to disagree on that. I mean, I, I want I trying to keep it as close as possible to the education and safety of kids. I mean, I, I feel like we're not going to come to agreement here, which happens all the time on this show. Yeah. Um, at, least, at least we're having a, a, a good conversation that's respectful. So. At the end of the day, to me, that's all that matters. And I do feel like there is a lot of common ground here. Right. Yeah, I do feel like there's a lot of common ground here. All right. So you don't have a conversation about guns without <laughs> everyone having an opinion. We want to hear what you think. And you have a way to do that. All you have to do is e email us. It's hearmeout at slate.com. Many of you are using that email already. We had Colin Grabo of the Cato Institute on last week. He was making the case against the U.S. sugar program. And we wanted to share this letter we got from a listener named Benjamin in response to Colin Grabo's remarks. Benjamin wrote, Economists have studied the sugar program for years. Interviewing some of the economists that have done those studies would have been appropriate rather than just relying on someone from Cato who might not even be an economist. And to be clear, the tariff functions just like a subsidy. The word subsidy was not even mentioned. I should note that Callan is a policy analyst and he is an expert in trade. And we did use the word subsidy. Uh, but your point is taken. He is not an economist. He is a policy expert. Look, we cover a lot of challenging opinions here. They are often quite complicated, and we love to hear your responses to them. We know you have your opinions, and we want to hear them. So email us, hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate and happens to have the best team in the business. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open.